it would be good just to say a word or two about myself since I didn't at the beginning. For those who do, don't know me very well, I've been here a couple of times and it's a delight to be back. Um, you probably picked this up anyway. I've been alluding to things, but I'm a, my uh, people will often ask when they come to St. Meinrich to visit, um, you know, if I'm giving a tour or talking in a group, they'll always say, So what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm monk. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the works that we do are buried quite a bit. Um, myself, and this sort of evolves over time. I've been a monk there for 30 years. It'll be 30 years this year. And it was announced in 1992. <clears throat> and it took about that long to get me sort of where I am, in a sense, because of the work that I do is not something that you come into a community thinking that you'd necessarily be doing, because it does, it's not really identifiable as a sort of job. I am a spiritual director, I am a retreat master. I do a lot of work like what we're doing today, in parishes, dioceses, religious communities of other sorts. Um, so I like to say that my work is preaching. So I'm a preacher. I decided very intentionally that that's what I wanted to go, a, a direction I wanted to head in because I was studying at the time at the Angelicum in Rome, getting a degree in spiritual theology to come back and teach in the seminary. But I, and during my time there, because I was, it was an interesting period of time for me between 2000 and 2003, I became intensely uh, interested in discerning my path. And there I was, a monk already, a priest. Um, and you would think I would have been done with discernment. <laughs> You're never done with discernment, it's an ongoing reality. And so I became very intensive about that and began to notice that I'm not really feeling very good about the academic world. It's not like it was bad or my experience was bad. Um, it's just that I didn't, for whatever reason, feel a sort of um, uh, a sort of positive sense of being called to do that sort of work. Although if you looked at my record, you'd be like, why wouldn't you? Look at all, I mean, I'm doing very well. I mean, you know. Um, I learned that I could write. I was, was very intimidated by whether or not I could write very well. But I learned, my professors kept giving me feedback and said, you know, this is wonderful work, you're um, spot on, et cetera. But I felt the call and I discerned it as this, to preach rather than teach. Now, the two aren't completely unrelated. Uh, we're talking about Jesus, the teacher. But he's primarily a preacher. And preaching is proclamation. So preaching is not explaining, it's about proclaiming. And one of the main ways that we've learned from Jesus when he calls us to preach is by demonstration, living out what we want to be. Or really, I like to say it this way, living out who we are, in fact, just have not fully realized that's who we are. So it is a process of coming into greater awareness and greater commitment to being true to who you are, to use the old standby maxim. To be true to who you are is to be true to who you are called by God to be in Christ. And that's a process of coming into a greater awareness and a greater commitment to be that way. So that's the message I preach. I tell guys all the time, I'm a spiritual director in our school, for seminarians, and I tell them all the time. Your task as a pastor is very simple. The nuts and bolts may be challenging, but it, the task, the overarching purpose is very simple. Wake people up. Wake them up to who they are. And make it very clear in your message, in your preaching, uh, about who they are as intended to be by God and who they are as in need of healing and growth need of fully realizing in themselves who they are and committing to that and growing in the freedom that will enable them to be who they truly are as those immersed in Christ, as those called to witness what it means to live under the politics of the gospel. Um, that's what our preaching ministry is to be about. And then I say this to you guys being joining for the priesthood, I say everything you're about needs to be rooted in that purpose wake people up, demonstrate that you yourself have awakened, even if you yourself, as we all have to humbly admit, have not fully realized everything yet 
in terms of feeling that fullness of freedom. That will come over time. And ultimately, it never comes absolutely anyway until what we call the resurrection. That's when we're fullest, full, most fully free. But an early patristic author, St. Irenaeus of Lyon, said, you know, the human person most fully alive, that is the glory of God. The human person most fully alive is the human person who's become most fully free to be who they are. Is intended by God to be. That's what life is, living in the truth. This is the way of being human as God intends us to be. And that gives glory to God because that just is the glory of God. You're an image and likeness of God and glory. This is a biblical term. The glory of God is the manifestation of God's presence. However, in the ancient world, in the Old Testament text, that was like angels, for example. These are the glory of God, the manifestation of God, the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire that led the Hebrews out of, out of Egypt in Exodus. The glory of God made manifest. Jesus now is believed by us to be the absolute perfect um, glory of God in human terms. He is the glory of God that we're all called to be as those called to be Christ in the world today. So as we wake up to the truth of who we are, we're more free to manifest the glory of God. We become more and more the glory of God simply by the way we live our lives in Imago Christi, in the image of Christ. That's why Jesus is adamant about disciples learning to follow him. Do as I do, imitate me. Take up your cross, follow me, embrace everything life will throw at you with love, patience, humility, compassion, and mercy, and generosity. This is what it means to be human as God intends us to be, the image of Christ. That gives glory to God. No, I like it to say it better. I'm a very existential kind of God. It doesn't give glory to God. It is the glory. It is the glory. You are the glory of God so far as you're living your life with that kind of freedom. We want to do that more and more, and we will as long as we're collaborating as a true disciple, living under the discipline of uh, prayer and reflection and the discipline of striving to imitate Christ in the various ways we're called to do each and every day. I want to read a prayer. This is a I came across this woman fairly recently, but I'm really, I really enjoyed her writing. She is a, a lay woman from England. She's she died of cancer at a rather early age. I think she was only 50, 53, maybe. Um, but she was a woman who was living in London during the Blitz, and she uh, was reflecting as a Roman Catholic, reflecting deeply about her experience of fear and her experience of the suffering of. Of the people who were being bombed day in and day out by the, the, the fascist regime. And uh, and then she lived into the 50s and saw some of the you know the, the ramifications of what we're called to be as people strove to heal from that deep and profound wound, either personally or collectively. Anyway, here's a prayer that she composed. And this is from a reflection called The Way of the Cross. This is a deep reflection on the stations of the cross. Jesus receives his cross. Lord, let me receive the cross gladly. Let me recognize your cross in my own and that of the whole world in yours. Do not let me shut my eyes to the magnitude of the world's sorrow or to the suffering of those nearest to me. Do not let me shrink from accepting my share in that which is too big for me, and do not let me fail in sympathy for that which seems trivial. Let me realize that because you have made my suffering yours and given it the power of your love, it can reach everyone everywhere. Those in my own home, those who seem to be out of my reach, this suffering can reach them all, with your healing, with your love. 
Let me always remember that those sufferings known only to myself, which seem to be without purpose and without meaning, are part of your plan to redeem the world. Make me patient to bear the burdens of those nearest at hand, to welcome inconvenience for them and frustration, even though it may seem to be causing them. Let me accept their temperaments just as they are. Let me nurse them in their sickness and share with them in their poverty, enter into their sorrows with them. Teach me to accept myself, my own temperament, my temptations, my limitations, my failures, the humiliation of being myself, even as I am. Allow me, Lord, all my life long to accept both small suffering and great suffering, certain that both through your love are redeeming the world together. In communion with all people everywhere, and above all with you, let me accept joyfully death and the fear of death, my death and the deaths of those I love, not with my will but yours, knowing that you have changed sorrow to joy and that you have changed death to life. Jesus, in fact, has changed everything. For us who believe in him, everything now appears differently. Even death itself is not what we thought it was. Not in our simply human mortal ways of thinking. Death has become something radically other than what we thought it was. It now becomes a liminal space within which we give our final consent to God as the creator and redeemer. It's a moment, as Karl Rahner, who was a Jesuit theologian in the 20th century, said, it's a final moment of handing oneself over into the hands of the one that we know by faith loves us radically and holds us even in death, holds us in his love and will raise us up. Because that's what it means to be true to who God is, to fulfill the promises made. So death becomes something not to be fearful of, but something that is radically open possibility, radically steeped in hope and futurity. It's a doorway, a liminal space, a moment of transition into the fullness of what it means to be human in God's image. Suffering too, as she says in this little prayer, which is more like a poem, uh, we have to begin to see our suffering differently, that our suffering is not just ours. In fact, as a Christian born and made new in Christ, it's not even ours at all. It belongs to Christ. It belongs to each one of us. Your suffering is my suffering. My suffering is yours because we are one. We are united. We are in Christ. So the suffering that Jesus endures in the passion and death on the cross is our suffering. It belongs to us. It's redemptive because it's the suffering of Christ. It's your suffering because you are Christ. So your suffering and his suffering are one. That's hard to get our heads wrapped around, but we have to, as a matter of faith, embrace that as the truth. It's what St. Paul teaches, it's what the Gospels proclaim, it's what Jesus seems to think. So we have to keep all of that in mind as we strive to endure or really um, to perceive the truth of what it is we suffer and what our suffering means. Victor Frankl um, was a Jew a psychotherapist during World War II who lived in Vienna. And of course, he got caught up in the fascist regime wanting to destroy all of the Jews. And he ends up in several concentration camps. Uh, he survives. And one of the things he was very focused on was discovering why it is some people survive and others do not, or why some seem to succumb very quickly um, to the, albeit horrific, ravages uh, and despair of the concentration camp in fascist Germany. 
He said one of the things he noticed that made the biggest difference was the sense of purpose. If you had a strong and convicted sense of purpose, that would be enormous, uh, an enormous boon to assist you in surviving the ravages of concentration. In fact, that itself, just that sort of desire to understand became Victor Frankl's sense of purpose. That in, in addition to the fact that he strove to help others as best he could, given the condition everyone was in to them as victims of a fascist problem to destroy. We have to think that way too. As a Christian, we have a purpose, a God-given vocation. We call it vocation because that's the word that means call. It doesn't come from us, it comes from God. And it's given to us in Christ. The purpose of each one of us who are baptized in Christ is precisely the same purpose that Jesus had, precisely the same. To be manifestations of God's love for the world. God so loved the world that he sent his only son. Not to condemn the world, but that it may have life. That's our purpose too. Our mission is the same as his, to wake people up to the truth of who they are as God's children, made in the image and likeness of God, and hold them accountable to that. And that's what we do as well, of preaching and demonstrating who God is as the one who loves and caused all things to be out of that love, and who God is as the one who loves and forgives us and also redeems and heals us and brings us to new and more abundant life. That has to be our purpose too. This purpose can't be some sort of theory. It needs to be very personal. It needs to be very personal. Which is why I think as the mainstay of becoming more free to be who we are, we have to pray frequently with the word of God. Which is why I insist in just about every retreat I do, I come to this point eventually, that the mainstay of your prayer needs to be with the scriptures. It needs to be the core heart of your discipline prayer. Not devotionals, because those are ancillary forms of prayer. But the scriptures, as even the ancient patristic author said, Ignatius of Antioch, not the least of them, if you do not know the scriptures, you do not know Christ. Because this, we believe, is a matter of faith, is a privileged form of the ongoing presence of Christ in our lives. That's why we refer to them as sacred scripture and not just some other document from the ancient world. Sacred scripture, a privileged way or means by which we can come into contact with the very spirit of God or the very person of Christ. Especially, of course, as we believe, when we pray with the Gospels. This is why in the liturgical tradition is a maxim in liturgical theology, ex operandis statuit legend credendi. It means the way we pray signifies what we believe. When we process into our churches with the book, you know what that book is, don't you? The book of the Gospels. It's not the lectionary. It's the book of the Gospels, which is why it usually is encased in some sort of very elaborate, oftentimes not always, but or if not, the cover at least is produced so it has some sort of uh, specific design suggesting four Gospels. Oftentimes you can buy these covers for them, and they're quite elaborate. By the way, they weigh a ton. <laughs> I never had to carry them. And this is why the gospel book is incense. Do you know what incense is all about? That goes back to the Levitical first temple ritual. Incense is what covered the divine presence so you couldn't look at it. If you looked at it, you would die, according to the Hebrew teaching. You cannot see God in the earth. So the smoke was to cover the divine presence whenever the high priest went into the Holy of Holies. The first thing they had to do was offer the incense in outside the Holy of Holies so the whole internal sanctuary would be covered in smoke. And it's not smoke like you or I see in our nice little church settings. This is billowing smoke. Probably you had a hard time breathing when you stepped into it. And it flowed up. You could see it rising above the inner veil 
up above and would rise up. The idea was to cover the divine glory. Anything, so today in our Christian churches, when we use incense, it's only associated with the presence of God. Now think about this. What sorts of things are incensed? The altar. The altar. And what does the altar signify? Yes, it signifies Christ. Yeah. So it signifies the passion and death of the Lord. It's the sacred sacrifice, the Lamb of God. That goes back to the temple tradition, too, in the first in the book of Leviticus. What else is incense? We are. I'm sorry. We are. When the we are. There you go. That's right. And Vatican II had to remind us all that the primary um, manifestation of the presence of Christ in the midst of the community is often the thing most overlooked, which is the community. That's the body of Christ, the mystical body of Christ. So the community is incense. The priest standing in the person of Christ as high priest is incense. Um, we incense the Paschal candle as a representation of the truth of the light of Christ at our Easter time celebrations. We, we incense the gospel book. So that was my long-winded way of saying, pray with the scriptures. <laughs> this is a privileged form of the presence of the word of God, who is Christ, and by Christ's spirit that dwells in you, again, it's a matter of faith, you believe that, um, you have access to the mind of Christ. St. Paul says, have the mind of Christ to be able to see everything differently. You've got to start seeing things as Christ saw sees them. So share, we share or participate in that mind, that awareness, that way of seeing things. And the way we consent to that and cultivate that, we say yes to that, is through our praying with the scriptures. The scriptures, especially, you know, if you pray with, with the, the uh, gospels on a regular basis, you begin to see the patterns of Jesus' behavior. And those are the patterns of God's good pleasure. These are the patterns of God's ways of doing things. The patterns of God's desire, which is distinctly different and over against, in fact, the patterns of worldly desire. You don't have to go very far to see examples of the patterns of worldly desire. They're all around us, and they're in fact within us, because we're all, we've all drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> We were born into a society that conditions us to do this, worldly patterns of desire. Our task as those now as adults who have seriously embraced the faith in Christ is to begin this process of becoming aware of those patterns of desire, patterns of behavior, rooted in desire. Because desire is what motivates us. God's patterns of desire are can be seen there in the Gospels, and they are reflected on by all the other books of the New Testament as well. They are already um, presented to us in various forms in the Old Testament tradition as well. So you can't just leave that aside as if it didn't matter. Jesus, in fact, uses his Bible as inspiration. I've already mentioned his love for Isaiah. He also loves Ezekiel and Jeremiah. And he always has in mind that the, the um, primordial um, creation story of Israel, which is the book of Exodus. And Jesus himself goes out into the desert to wrestle with all of the worldly patterns of temptation. He named him Satan. He personified it as Satan. But really what Jesus is wrestling with is his condition. Patterns of worldly desire for power, privilege, prestige. Patterns of worldly desire. Those are the things that he's tempted by, just because of his humanity, because he was born into a society, a world that establishes that in every one of us who's born into this world, including Jesus. So Jesus had to do that wrestling, that contending with the patterns of worldly desire. And Jesus triumphed, of course, but as one contemporary author in fact, it's a commentary. It's very interesting to see. A very uh, good commentary about the um, gospel story we're going to have this weekend uh, about the wrestling match between Jesus and Satan. But Jesus is 
is what we should see there is Jesus depicting everything he's up to in this world as part of his mission. This is what he's doing for us. He is triumphing over worldly patterns of desire. And he's not doing it in, in just in some sort of um, vicarious way. Jesus is not a vicarious redeemer. He's calling you to participate in this struggle as well. He's not, and I'm afraid a lot of church preaching in the last several centuries has, has sort of implied this. He doesn't do it so you don't have to. That's contrary to the Pauline doctrine. You are in Christ. In him, you are doing it, too. In him, you are wrestling with and contending with the patterns of worldly desire. And so, insofar as you remain firmly rooted in him through the discipline of your life of prayer and service, you will triumph. You will triumph. Because he is triumphed, and in him, you will triumph. So I, you know, we got to kind of wake up sometimes to the way we say things. Sometimes I'm afraid, well-meaning though it may be, we act or speak as if Jesus did it for us so we wouldn't have to. Nope, that's not the way it works. It ain't magic. And that would be very paganish, magical thing. So it's harder than that. It's not cheap grace, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, another one of my favorite preachers from the 20th century. He died in a Nazi concentration camp as well. Great Lutheran preacher, he said, enough of this thinking about grace as if it were cheap. It's very costly. The demands of charity are precisely that. They are demanding. They will cost some. They will be, they are something you've got to really strive because of all this conditioning all this fear and all of these attachments. So I wrote a reflection I wanted to share with you. I brought this along with me. I wasn't sure if I would, but this is a reflection I wrote on Ash Wednesday. In the monastery, Ash Wednesday is a very uh, serious day. We take that as a penitential day, of course, as the church is supposed to. Um, most of the monks will not go to their work that day. They'll spend a day in prayer and reflection. Um, fasting, and deeply reflecting on their spiritual reading, especially their Lexio Divina, as we call it, the scriptural prayer that they're doing that day. And I used, at one point, um, the text from the second reading of the Wednesday, Ash, Ash Wednesday Mass, which is the same every year. The readings are the same on Ash Wednesday every year. Um, it's one of the few days, maybe one of the only days where the readings are always the same. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20 to chapter 6, verse 2. But this reflection comes out of my frame of that. So this is an example of me meditating out loud. St. Paul wrote in his second letter to the church in Corinth. The second reading for the Mass on Ash Wednesday every year is taken from that letter. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, I took that, those are two verses, verses 20 and 21. And every time I come across that, I'm just like befuddled. What does it mean to call Christ sin? He made him to be sin, who himself knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So that's the jumping off point for my prayer. Now notice it's just one verse. This is kind of how Lexia works. You read through the whole thing and then you come, something draws you in. Something is enticing. Some, some sort of desire rolls up in you to better understand 
apprehend or contact something coming through these words. So this is what I, I got from that. To be Christian is to be an ambassador for Christ. And I can understand that. That means to be an agent for the one who's chosen you and sent you to act and speak in his name. Baptized and anointed in Christ, we are chosen and sent for the message to proclaim. And in this, we share the mission of Jesus. St. Paul teaches in his baptismal theology that baptized into Christ, we are as Jesus was himself. Sent to proclaim a divine message in human words and demonstrated through human actions. The very real sense we are to personify the gospel just as Jesus did. To be what we proclaim. This was the mission of Christ. It's who he was, who he is, and who in Christ we are called to be. In Christ, writes St. Paul, we are the righteousness of God. In Christ, we too are made sin for the world. And in Christ, we too die to reveal death as the wages of sin. By patient endurance, together with Christ, in Christ, we too suffer the effects of human actions that are contrary to truth, human behaviors, our own and others, contrary to love. And in Christ, we are raised up and made new, because in Christ, death no longer has dominion over us. I quoted Romans 6, verse 9, right there. By identifying with Christ, being in Christ, we work together as the whole Christ, hidden in the mystical body, as Paul continues in this letter. As servants of God, he writes, we have commended ourselves in every way to great endurance. Now, notice in this passage the, in, the word in. In afflictions, in hardships, in calamities, in beatings, in imprisonments, in riots, in labors, in sleepless nights, in hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, Genuine love, truthful speech, this could be the list of the fruits of the Spirit as well. And the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated sometimes as imposters and yet we remain true, as unknown and yet we are well known, as dying and see we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. In Christ, this is me again, not Paul. In Christ, we possess everything, because in Christ, we are God's children. In Christ, we share in his life and his divinity, because we share in his spirit which together with our spirits bears witness that we are children of God. Romans 8, verse 16. Our salvation is now, St. Paul wrote just a few verses before this one I quoted above, where he says, so if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, see, everything has become new. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We have only to receive fully the risen life of Christ to share broadly and generously that life with others. For everything we've been given is meant by God to be shared. But by receiving and sharing Christ, we realize the new creation that we are in Christ. And we bring to reality a new way of being human to finally and fully realize the truth of who we are. That term in Christ is absolutely critical. And if you 
and focus your energy on really appropriating this understanding of yourself as always this new creation in Christ and come to live out of that awareness of who you are in Christ, you will be more apt to be able to see what it is Christ wants you to see so as to respond more freely to whatever the situation may bring, whatever this moment uh, consists of, to respond to it in a way that's loving, generous, merciful, kind, compassionate, maybe assertive, but for the sake of truth and the dignity of the other, or one's own dignity, as made in the image and likeness of God. Hospitality is about being receptive to the other. And the first one that we must learn to be receptive to is Christ, the very God who we believe, as a matter of fact, dwells within us by virtue of his spirit. So think of your prayer, the times you spend praying alone with God and collectively in community, in liturgy and worship especially in the Eucharist, as moments of hospitality, receiving what is being offered, and what's being offered is the very presence of God. And then giving to the other your very presence. The two of you come together as two freemen. And where there is that quality of freedom, you'll find the perfection of love. Because love requires food. Love is what we do when we're totally free from our fear. We just fall back into the truth of who we are, as intended by God to be. Now you may be asking yourself, so hospitality, it's, it's to make the connection uh, between hospitality and all of these sort of um, traditional spiritual understandings of things. This is why I insist that hospitality as an attitude of receptivity is at the very core uh, and foundation of what it means to be a Christian living in the world, which is why the church, according to the testimony I read earlier today, seems to hold hospitality up as one of the fundamental characterization or character traits of a serious Christian or a person who is in Christ. Hospitality is a word that summarizes or summates the entire mindset of Jesus himself. Describes the way Jesus relates to others, irrespective of who the other is, whether the other is a fellow Jew or a fellow Galilean, or a fellow working class man or woman, prince or pauper, Pharisee or sinner, all fellow human beings are treated with equanimity because Jesus has a perfect quality of freedom. Jesus is receptive and responsive to need, and our deepest need is for redemption itself, the transformation of our worldview, which just is eternal life as participation in or communion with God. Not wanting to get ahead of myself, but that's why we refer to the high point of the Eucharist as communion. It's a mystical moment wherein we receive the fullness of who God is for us as incarnate, servant, sacrifice for redemption, high priest, as God, as brother. All of it is signified by that little piece of bread that you receive into yourself, that you receive into yourself. And in receiving, I think this also, this thought comes from um, Bonhoeffer, in receiving, we are received. This way of being human is rooted, as I've said in our origin story from Gen Genesis. And God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. This was God's intention from the beginning. It's the phrase I use. It's a biblical phrase. In the beginning, this is God's intention. 
and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in the divine image, the image of God. God created them, male and female. God created them and blessed them. So our ways of relating to others is rooted in that very biblical concept, that very biblical teaching, fundamental teaching of our faith. This is what Jesus is trying to wake us up to, this reality that we always have been because God has always intended it from the beginning. And although we have failed in too many ways to count, to realize the truth of who we are as intended by God to be, we nonetheless find redemption by waking up to that truth and then committing to live that truth in the concrete, ordinary experiences of our daily lives. This is what it means to follow Jesus, to follow Christ. Our ways of relating to others have to be rooted in this biblical faith, the demands of right relationship, which is a biblical understanding of justice. Justice is not about punishment or retribution. Justice is about establishing right relationships or reforging relationships so that they are right again, where they've been wounded or broken. It's about reconciling or uh, it's, it's about restoring what has been uh, either damaged or destroyed by our sinful, selfish behavior. That's biblical justice. That is the righteousness of God. To become the righteousness of God, as St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, is to live out of the truth of who you are as intended by God to be. That's right relationship. You with God, you with neighbor. That's the righteousness of God. That's justice. St. Paul calls it justification. This is the essence of redemption. To offend human dignity, then, is a direct offense against oneself, one's truth, and the Creator, of course, is the source of that truth. Sin militates against God's will, God's word, God's image. In a very real sense, the failure to respect the dignity of human persons, ourselves and others, is the primary way he blasphemed the name of God. I become so sensitive to this concept that I can't hear barely anymore in the confessional when people, especially kids, confess blasphemy. They talk about taking the name of the Lord, in, uh, the name of the Lord in vain, because they got upset and said God or Lord or GD. I say, okay, I understand that, and from a kid's perspective, I definitely understand that. What I want them to come to see is that's not primarily what God is concerned with. Because the name of God, remember, signifies the essence of who God is. The primary way you can offend the untouchable, intangible, unknowable, infinitely invisible um, essence of God is by offending the image of the image of God, the seeable, knowable, tangible reality is the human person, according to the biblical faith. It's what we do to offend the other human being, or even our own dignity, that most clearly blasphemes the name of the Lord, takes the name of the Lord in vain. So if we can wake up to that, maybe we can see more clearly how our offenses against the dignity of other human persons, or our own dignity, offends against God. So that we can take seriously, uh, you know, even small things that we do, knowingly and intentionally to offend against the other because of a sense of a need for retribution, a need to defend self over against the other, a need to compete and win, the need to be right, the need to be powerful, and all these things that we fall back on to assert the self over against the other. That's the nature, that's the sort of substrate 
structure and mechanism of sin. And mind you, this is the primary way we blaspheme the name of God and in the dignity of the other. To treat others in their human dignity as their human dignity demands is also a way for us then to honor our living God, to honor our own human dignity as images and likenesses of God. There's no better way to do that than to act as Jesus acts when dealing or relating to other persons, to act as God acts, to be like God in the way he relates to humanity, is to respond to the other person in a godly or godlike manner, demonstrating through action our belief in God's word about humanity as images and likenesses of the Creator. And when we do that in the concrete, when we do that in actual terms, simple though they may be, we realize that is to say, we concretely manifest our own truth as images and likenesses of God. That is why that little thought is why Thomas Merton could say to be a saint is to be yourself. But you have to understand what he means by self. To be a self, to be yourself with a capital S, to be who you are in Christ. That's what a saint is, a person that is so radically free and therefore so freely loving as to be Christ for others. This is what defines a saint. Thomas Merton famously, uh, his story is told by his best friend, Lax. Uh, Rob, Robert Lax was his best buddy at college when he was at Columbia. And, uh, Thomas Merton by that time was on the uh, cusp of converting to Catholicism. He was really taken up by writings of the patristic authors and he would just, he was almost obsessed by it. And his best friend at that time was, was Lax, and Lax was a Jew, although not a very pious or practicing Jew. But he wasn't a Christian, at least not yet. He would become one later. But finally, they're walking down the streets on the campus in Columbia, at Columbia, and uh, Merton's going on and on about this. And finally, Lax just stops dead, stops him dead in their tracks right there on the sidewalk, and he says, Daggone it. Tom, what is it you really want? What is it you really want? He was struggling with you know, what direction to head in life. And he said, Lax, I just want to be a saint. And then Lax said to him the most profound thing Merton said he ever saw it said to him, which is this. Then daggone it, be one. Be what you want to be. And it was so profound because that's kind of what got Merton thinking about what does it mean to be a saint? Well, it really means to be yourself, but you got to know the self you want to be. You have to know yourself. That goes back to the ancient myths to history, philosophy. To know thyself is to be truly human. And that is brought into the Gospels in this fashion. You've got to learn to know who we are as those immersed in Christ. An infant that's baptized can't know that, but an adult is capable now of the freedom needed to commit to that journey of self-knowledge, self-awareness, and growth. And so that's why prayer is so fundamental. It's, it's what we do to consent to what God wants to teach us about who we truly are as made in the image and likeness of God. To wake up to it and then to commit to living out of it. And Jesus himself, of course, is the way to make clear to all what this entails in practice. God himself becomes human and shows us the way. In the Gospels, Jesus teaches and demonstrates how to act in a godly or godlike way by being human as God intended us to be. By the incarnation, the word of God has shown us the way to redemption to be who God intends us to be, which is what salvation means in the most fundamental sense. Now, let me be very clear, and this may sort of cause you to sit up and take note. Jesus did not come into the world just to save Roman Catholics. <laughs> nope. What does John's gospel say? 
is the motivation for becoming human. What is it? God so loved the world because God so loved the world that he sent his only son, right? So what's the motivation? No, God so loved the world. That's the motivation. It's love. And John, in his first letter, will say that just is God. God is God's own self-motivation. You are an image and likeness of God, and so love must be your own self-motivation. Love, caritas, charity, it's not just any kind of love. It certainly isn't merely worldly ways of loving. It's godly ways of loving. This is the motivational principle that should direct every choice you make. Some, you, so when I tell people when they're discerning some choice or some path in life or some maybe definite decision they need to make, A, not B, uh, I always tell them, can you frame this choice in terms of love? And when I say love, I don't mean just self-motivated uh, feelings of pleasure. Love is not romance. Love is hard and difficult and challenging. That's why it's a demand. The, the way the, the scriptures and the uh, theologians reflecting on these sacred texts define love like this. Love is pursuing what is good for another at a cost to oneself. Pursuing what's good for another at a cost to oneself is costly grace. It's precisely what Jesus demonstrates in no uncertain terms as the primary pattern of God's pleasure, God's pattern of behavior. That's the crucifixion, the passion and death. Jesus laying down his life out of love for others. Jesus willingly stepping into the crosshairs of unjust systems, religious and secular, in order to demonstrate what injustice leads to. Scapegoating sacrifices all for the sake of in-group coherence. So for the Jews to protect their faith, this man must die. For the Jews to protect their nationhood, this man must die. That's the way it's put in John's gospel, according to the high priest, kind of this. The Romans, it's about protecting what? In, it's about protecting the honor of the emperor. It's about protecting the Pax Romana, which by the way, is anything but peace. It's, it's an enforced peace. It's worldly peace. That was well-established doctrine by Jesus' day. It was established by the Emperor Augustus, uh, Augustus. Anybody that offended the Pax Romana, Mot Yimat in Hebrew, they would die, would be destroyed. So this is what's being protected from the secular uh, uh, side of the equation. Jesus is not just condemned because he's a blasphemer against this Jewish God. From the Roman perspective, he's an insurrectionist. From the Jewish perspective, it's fear, pure and simple. If we don't do this, they would just they will destroy us. If they if they see this Jewish rabbi as an insurrectionist, they could punish the whole people. So it's fear. It's always fear that motivates this way of scapegoating people. We find our security in having a common enemy. And in this case, the scapegoating mechanism fell on Jesus, and he was destroyed for it. So one of the first things Jesus' passion and death reveals to us is that side of the human equation that has to do with sin, brokenness, and fear. What happens when we allow our fear to collectivize is the destruction of human life unjustly and uh, a radical sin against the dignity of God as the creator of humanity in his own age. Not just by the destruction of this particular man, but by the way they're living their lives as human beings driven by, driven by, and fraught with fear. Because that's not freedom. Fear is the opposite. That's why love requires freedom, because love casts out all fear. So Jesus reveals 
the sinfulness of humanity, and he reveals at the same time the radical nature of love, even human love that's been divinized, which is what the incarnation is all about. A radical love that lays down his own mortal life for the sake of what's good for others. What's the good that he's, he's giving to us? First of all, the truth about who we are as sinful, divisive, and unjust. And secondly, what we're called to be, and that message doesn't become clear until we finally see the resurrection, where the Father, as we understand it now theologically, the Father raises the Son as a way of ratifying what he said, what he did, who he was. The resurrection is understood as the ratification by God of all a person is. Jesus also, of course, is revealing the radical nature of love just in itself. This is how much I love you. I love the world. In John's gospel, he insists on it because Pilate's going to ask him about that. Uh, Jesus will insist. He'll say, you do not take my life from me. I lay it down freely, and I will take it up again. It's his choice. He's made this choice. Uh, in other words, Jesus is insisting that Pilate is confused. Pilate, you are not in charge here. You're not actually in control. Why? This fear is your primary motivation. Now, for Pilate, you can imagine why this would be the case. What if he botches the job he's been given by the emperor to do? What if Jesus really is an insurrectionist and the Jews, which they will just a few decades later, rise up and rebel? I could lose my job, I could lose my standing with the emperor, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all that's playing in the background. It's not evident that the gospel writers are concerned with that. But you do have to know, based on how human beings work, that that's always in play. It's always in play. It's fear that's always in play. Jesus relates back to relating to other people in the way Jesus demonstrates it. Even long before he gets taken up in the last moment of his service through the passion and death, Jesus demonstrates throughout the Gospels the best way to relate to people in terms of honoring their dignity as the images and likenesses of God. All people, no matter who, pagan, Gentiles, and others, whom the pious Jews of his day would categorize as unbelievers, unredeemed, or unclean. So we saw earlier today in the example from Luke's gospel in, this, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. In Mark chapter 7, there are lessons on what makes a person clean or righteous. Hint, it's not religion that makes you clean or righteous. Jesus responds to Pharisees and scribes who are religious authorities. Concerned with obedience to Torah as a means of establishing Jewish identity. But Jesus focuses his comments on the Torah regulation about certain foods prescribed as unclean. And he says that adherence to religious custom and law does not justify a person in the eyes of God. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 8. And he warns them, and by extension, he warns us as his disciples for today that we must not pay lip service to God, but honor God with our hearts. So it's not about externalized behaviors that we do oftentimes because they make us feel like part of the in-group. It makes us feel safe to conform with the expectations of the in-group. Now, that's not to say that those behaviors are all bad. We do it all the time. That's just human. But what we have to learn to see is that that's not what makes you righteous, but rather what is in the heart, the truth of who you are, the foundation of yourself as made in the image and likeness of God. This is what's meant by the heart. That's the locus of the indwelling spirit. The heart is what matters. The heart is the core of your personal identity before God. It's the ground of a person's sense of self. From the heart, we choose our actions. 
Jesus has to further explain himself to the disciples in Mark 7, verses 17 to 23, just to make himself clear. Then the text moves us to Jesus' demonstration of his teachings with respect to a particular person. I'm going to focus in on this person. So Mark 7, verses 24 to 30. After all that, um, all that kind of ground laying, he's talking about what justifies us. It's the heart, not externalized behaviors. It's not your religion that makes you pleasing to God. Uh, it's the heart. It's who you are, essentially, that pleases God, or not, in terms of the living out of that truth. So Jesus has an encounter with a woman while he's up there preaching in the northern parts of what we would call today the Holy Land, but he is north of Galilee in a region they call Tyre and Sidon. It's, it's, uh, at that time, it was called uh, Syria. Syria was a Roman province. So the cities, and they're still there today, Tyre and Sidon, the coastal cities, they were Phoenician in their ancient days, established by the Phoenicians. This woman is a Syro-Phoenician. She's from the region. She's not a Jew. She's a pagan. Okay? She's a Canaanite. Jesus engages her because she's come to seek him out. Jesus is there in the city. And he apparently is having a, uh, he's meeting with somebody in their home, and it's presumed by the gospel writer that you realize that is a Jewish home that he's gone into. They're very rare up in that area. Jesus is simply following the usual sort of behaviors of a pious rabbi. The woman finds him, she breaks into the supper, and she comes to him begging on her knees that he would heal her daughter. So there you have right there, this is a woman motivated by love. It's a, it's a very special form of love, a mother for her daughter. But she's not there for herself. She's there for her daughter. That's the first thing you need to notice. And she's begging Jesus, and she seems to have an awful lot of faith that Jesus could do something about this. She's apparently possessed by a demon. That's, you know, we don't know exactly what was wrong, but it's enough that she's worried about her survival. And Jesus focusing his comments kind of displays for the others and for us by extension to see. This is Jesus at the moment that, that he's found by this woman, simply reverting to the typical sort of, sort of uh, pattern of behavior for a rabbi in his day. And he responds with what seems like a rather heartless thing to say. And he says, you know, the food is for the children. Right? And we do not we do not give to the dogs what belongs to the children. It sounds very, very harsh. In my view, and I think others that I've read has come to this, this is this is the gospel writer having Jesus lay something out so that you can, it's kind of rhetorical. Jesus is saying, is this really the way I'm I need you to behave? What happens, of course, is you know the story, the woman takes no will not take no for an answer. She has a great comeback. Believe in the dogs, get the scraps that fall from the table of the children. Right? The children still, there's that famous line, that, that uh, comeback. And Jesus is wowed by it. It's awesome. Jesus is totally wowed by that. He says, woman, for saying that, you can go your way. Your daughter is here. Now, what's interesting is, and this is what you have to do when you pray with the gospel. Sometimes you have to step back a little bit away from the story to see the context. The next thing we have is Jesus healing a guy with a withered hand, but he's still up there in Gentile territory. It's still a Gentile. Now he's healing Gentiles. Contrary to what he said before, because in my view, anyway, that was purely rhetorical. He's saying, in effect, you think this is what I'm about? You think I'm coming into the world because God just loves Jews? No, think again. And so through the Syrophoenician exchange, the, one, the, the exchange with the Syrophoenician woman, his reception of her, the whole ministry changes. He heals the man with the withered 
hand. And then the next thing we have is the scene of the second scene of a feeding of the multitude. The first feeding of the multitude was in Jewish terrain, Judea. It would have been a crowd made up predominantly, if not entirely, of Jews. Now he's up there in the Decapolis, which are several cities up to the northeast, and they're all Gentile. This is Gentile territory. So now he's feeding 4,000 in the region of the Gentiles, seven loaves, seven baskets left over. Seven is a, a biblical number that means abundance. Seven loaves, but seven also means something else for those who have eyes to see it. The sevens signify the seven displaced nations of Canaan. In Deuteronomy 7, verse 1. They're all listed there. Let me bring that up and read it to you. These are the nations of the Gentiles or the Canaanites displaced by the Hebrews, violently displaced, according to the text. And what does it say there? Seven Deuteronomy 7. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that you are about to enter and occupy. And he clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hebites, and the Jebusites, seven nations mightier and more numerous than you. So this is Jesus taking what is like quintessentially concentrated Torah teaching from Deuteronomy and saying, you know what? It's not what you think. And he expands it, he explodes it, he breaks it open, does what he often does by saying, amen, amen, I say to you, you've heard it said, but I say to you this. You've heard it said that God is just for you, but I am here to tell you he's for the world. And so we see Jesus now expanding his ministry, well, at least as depicted in this version of the Gospel account of Luke, as expanding his ministry so that we can become very clear about who Jesus loves. So that when we try to follow him through emulation, through imitation, the demands of charity are very clear. That no one is left out of the demand of love. No one, no matter who they may be, no matter how unclean your in-group might claim, they are. That's huge, and that's something all of us, in terms of hospitality as being receptivity of the other as other, this is something that we need to real, really ponder and reflect on in terms of becoming more receptive to the other, more Christ-like in terms of hospitality, welcoming the other out of love, motivated entirely by love, uh, and the desire to share life. Now, what inhibits us? Um, what inhibits us? Well, I've said it many times, but I want to focus my attention on it now. Fear is the great inhibitor, first of all, fundamental fear. The inhibitor of spiritual freedom and root of all divisive rivalry and violent competition is fear. Merton wrote an essay back in 1962. By that time, in his own personal um, reflection and prayer, as well as the um, stuff that he was writing, the spiritual stuff that he was writing. And this was his most prolific moment in his life, uh, the early 60s. He began to focus really a lot on violence, war, nuclear proliferation, and civil rights. And he begins to think of it in terms of hospitality and receptivity of the other. And he wrote this uh, marvelous essay, and I encourage you all to get a hold of it. It's online in various places. Um, the root of war is fear. The root of war is fear. It is the final and absolute cause for all of it. Because it's the final and absolute cause for all violence. Fear. Now, what causes that fear in all of us, and everybody is born into this situation, being driven by fear, motivated by fear, is social conditioning, first of all. There's socialized or competitive rivalry. 
And a lot of it has to do, as I've already suggested, with this sort of basic lizard brain, ancient DNA in every one of us, to use that term broadly. It's our cultural conditioning that says to feel safe requires that you feel a part of a greater reality. And that's true. The question is, what greater reality do you want to be part of? And can that thing you claim makes you say, really make you say? Throughout the Old Testament, God insists over and over again, I am your salvation. I am your refuge. I am your um, rock. I am your protection. Over and over throughout the Psalms, especially we see it over and over. I am the source of your safety and salvation. Now, in terms of in-group thinking, in-group identification, none of that is abnormal. It's very normal and in some respects quite healthy. What God has done though, is he's co-opted it. And he said, okay, if you find your safety, which is the way you're made, if you find your safety in greater realities beyond yourself, why not find your safety in me? Why not find your safety in me, says the Lord. And now for us, that means finding our safety in Christ. And, if, and again, another step of the logic is to find our safety in the collective made up of all those who are in Christ. And what's that, what's that a way of saying? To find our safety in the collective we call the church, right? In that sense, the church being fundamentally all those who are in Christ, who participate in the life of Christ consciously. And this is the in-group now we choose. Tribalism otherwise causes our in-group thinking to be over against. Uh, and oftentimes we find the coherence we want in our tribes through scapegoating mechanisms by establishing a common enemy. We see this in our politics all the time. And we see it in our international relations. We also see it in the way religions relate to each other. My goodness, Christianity is fraught with it. Tribalism, not a healthy tribalism, but a worldly pattern of behavior. We're also conditioned by zero sum game thinking, meaning that we have to compete in order to feel we have enough, in order to feel safe so that we're not afraid. But enough is never enough. That's the problem. We never feel safe because our stuff cannot establish our safety. So in zero-sum game thinking, that means if I've got, if I need more necessarily, you need, you, you get less. If I need more, that means you have to have less because you're not in my in-group. And then there's biased and prejudicial thinking. There's a lot of work being done on biased thinking, um, unconscious bias, different Difference signifies threat or danger. Um, so, for example, some uh, some forms of unconscious bias that are that are being examined these days by social psychologists: affirmation bias. So, for example, um, we do what we do in order to feel affirmed. Uh, I will please you so that you can affirm me. That makes me feel like part of the group. It makes me feel safe. Um, or I, I only will connect with people who I know agree with me. That's called confirmation bias. That makes me feel safe because it makes me feel part of an in-group, which I know is where I find my safety. At least I feel safe. Various forms of identification bias, whereby we feel safe, safer with those who are like us in certain ways, politically, racially, culturally, religiously, et cetera. And these are all of the manifestations of this social conditioning that we all receive because we've all jumped the Kool Aid. And all of us are driven in various ways according to our personalities and temperaments by these social conditionings rooted in fear. Another thing, though, that we're conditioned or that we uh, imbibe as part of our enculturation is attachments. What we're conditioned to think. Having certain, we're conditioned to think having certain things makes us safe. 
It makes us feel safe and therefore not afraid. Now, here's an, un an unusual, and I learned this um, more recently, a great way of understanding what happiness is. Everybody thinks they're pursuing happiness. We've even sort of, you know, we've codified that in our American ethos, the pursuit of happiness. Everybody has a right to that, right? What is happiness? Is it a thing? Is it a possession? Here's one way of understanding it from a biblical perspective and from the perspective of, of what I'm saying to you today. Happiness is the name we give to the sensation of feeling free from fear. Now, happiness is a sensation. That's the way we always talk about it. I feel happy. Happiness is the name we give to the sensation of feeling free from fear. It's fear of losing what we think makes us happy that makes us anxious. It only heightens our fear. So attachments are the things, now we can attach to a lot of different things. So for example, money. In, in an economy that's, you know, like ours, a capitalist economy, the more money we have, the more freedom we think we have, right? That's the logic. That's a pattern of worldly thinking. And therefore, the more freedom you have, or excuse me, the more freedom from fear you have, because now I can go out and get whatever I want for me, and I don't need to worry about my ability to do that. That's what we think makes us free from fear. Fact is, it doesn't. Because the more you have, the more anxious you are about losing what you have. And that's fear. We can also attach to the need to control, the need to be in charge, the need to be right. You know, other forms of power, the need um, you know, to be the, the smartest one in the room, to be the holiest one in the church, uh, the need to be um, in control of everything which is absurd, but we try to do it all the time. So attachments are a fundamental in the ancient world in the, in the uh, ascetical centuries of the first generations of Christians. They focused a lot of their energies on what sorts of things we attach to. And they came up with a word that is a word that describes freedom, spiritual freedom from our attachments. And the word was apatheia. And it looks like apathy, but what it literally means is freedom from passion. Ah, it, the letter A is a prefix in Greek that is a negation. It means without passion. Without passion here, though, means not without feelings. No, it doesn't mean that. Not without emotions. No, it doesn't mean that. It means that your feelings and desires, your emotions, do not dictate your behavior. You are aware enough Therefore, free enough to allow yourself to feel what you feel, but choose in freedom to love. Choose compassion, choose mercy, choose selflessness, choose service. Whatever it is you're choosing, it is an act of love. Uh, over against what you might feel, which would be a little maybe trepidation, anxiety, or outright fear, um, risk, uh, all those things that tend to inhibit us from being Apatheia is freedom from attachments. Our wounds, I've mentioned those, our wounds will inhibit us. Disappointments and hurts that come from those we thought we could trust over time, over our childhood especially, especially loved ones, but also social groups that we've identified with that seem to be rejecting me in some way, even surreptitiously. Those are wounds, and those can continue to fester and cause us to behave in ways that we are not, uh, that are not loved, that are not generous, mostly because we're not aware of them. And then finally, shame, which is a kind of wound. It's a deep wound that comes from a false belief that I am not enough, that I am not enough. That despite my faith that I made in the image and likeness of God, I still don't believe I'm enough. I'm not good enough, I'm not holy enough, I'm not loving enough, I'm not acceptable enough. That's shame, and that's a profoundly deep wound. Most of us carry a bit of it around. 
I'm not sure anybody that's had a child without a bit of that kind of wound. The key to the spiritual life, and some of our prayer can help us to, to, to see this, is how that shame motivates us in certain ways. When we're constantly striving to earn the approval of others in order to feel like we're enough or that we're lovable. So shame isn't about shame is about one's perceived self-worth. It's rooted in a fundamental lie about yourself that you're not enough. But it's also one of the most common wounds that people bear into their adult years. Now, guilt, which oftentimes gets confused with shame, is the sensation of dissonance that rises up from within because my behavior, not me, but my behavior fell short of who I know I am to be, of who I know I am called to be or claim to be as a child of God. So insofar as we are steeping ourselves in the sacred word of God and becoming more and more intimate with Christ over time through the sacramental life and through the life of prayer, my conscience becomes more um, honed, more uh, able, to distinguish good and bad, right behavior, just behavior from unjust behavior. The closer you get to Christ, the more formed your conscience becomes because it's by knowing Christ that your conscience is formed. The conscience just is the sensation that we feel when we've done something we realize fell short of love, fell short of commands of truth. Rooting out shame and becoming aware of how shame has motivated us in certain ways is a profound way of arriving more at your truth uh, and a profound way of allowing the spirit of Christ that's within you to heal that wound so that you can become more free, free from that wound, and the deleterious effects of it to become free to love. Okay. We've arrived right at two o'clock, which is the end point for this conference. Um, tomorrow, just as a refresher, after mass, we're going to start at one, right? And it'll be in the building next door. Um, before I let you all go, does anybody have a question, that, something about something that came up that seemed confusing that I can respond to quickly? Oh, the one I quoted from. Carol Houselander. And she spells with Carol as C A R Y L L. Pretty British. Houselander, just like it sounds. Uh, she's written many marvelous things. The Weed of God is a beautiful book if you ever get a chance to. The Way of the Cross. Oh, yeah. That page I read from is page 17. Anybody else? Yes. You also had a phrase that I missed the second half. It says, the way we pray is the, and then I missed the rest of it. Oh, probably that. that the, it was towards the beginning. Yeah, the, the Lex Arandi statue legend Fidendi quote. Um, the way we pray uh, signifies what we believe. We pray. That's a liturgical maxim. So, you know, if you look at the way we pray, and when I say we, I mean we, it's the church. So look at the Eucharist. The way we do the Eucharist in every respect <coughs> signifies what we believe and all of its rich, the richness of ritual. Everything we do in, is intended to convey something fundamental about our belief in who God is, who we are, and who we're to be about as the church. So. Tomorrow, the conference will focus especially on our Eucharistic sense of self as the church and as individuals, too, because we have that as individuals. Okay. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, and now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Have a good afternoon.